Hello and welcome. This is the Mutiny Investing Podcast. This podcast features long-form conversations on topics relating to investing, markets, risk, volatility, and complex systems. All right, Tom Morgan, I want you to just plug away right at the top. Where can people find your fantastic blog? Where can they find you on Twitter? Plug away, please. (laughs) <laughs> but usually usually i do this at the end of the call when no, everyone who's no. now everyone who's, who's ever listened to a podcast of mine realizes that one thing about me which is i don't know my own twitter handle uh, which is like you're like you've got one job tom know your own twitter handle no it's uh tom underscore morgan kcp on twitter and um uh i write for the kcpgroup.com and uh the insight section is uh, bang up top of the website and everything that i write uh, is published there and highly recommend it. And if for some reason, somehow people haven't heard you on other podcasts like Jim Oshag's and everything, they should run out right away. They should just press pause, go read the blog, go listen to you on another podcast because it's going to be much better than my line of questions probably in, in general. But yeah, the reason I do the plug at the top, actually, I learned this from another uh, comedian's podcast. He's like, yeah, he hasn't plug at the beginning and then the end. I was like, that's brilliant. You know, like, because sometimes everybody doesn't start listening to the end, you know, and sometimes you got to plug away, you know, and it's always my impetus. I got to be the one that that drives that. So that way you don't feel too terrible about it. Because even though I could watch your reaction, you're like, I don't want to plug myself. <laughs> you know, that's how that's how we all feel. But the the impetus for this conversation was, uh, I mean, not that we needed one was your latest paper, the tipping point when you did which you did a little bit more long form than usual. And I think the best way to for the dive into that is let's maybe start with what I'll call the uh, the Morgan dialectic you know, kind of riffing off of, of Hegel's dialectic is I assume that was kind of the impetus for when you're thinking about the the triumvirate of the dialectic there. But like, why don't you why don't you start there? And then maybe that'll give us a, a jumping off point. I don't even know what dialectic means. Like, this is how this is how badly things are going to start. Like, I, <laughs> well, that, no, this is this shows that great minds think alike. So people know that uh, Hegelian dialectic is that uh, synth, synthesis, sorry, excuse me, thesis, counter thesis, then synthesis i'm always going to have problems with synthesis so it goes goes thesis counter thesis synthesis and a lot of people attribute it to hegel and coming out of idealism but i think it was actually really fichte which is most idealism actually could be attributed to johann fichte but usually uh you know hegel or um you know others get credit but um that yeah that's the hegelian dialectic is kind of like that tripartite like kind of circular nature um so yeah, I'm like, <laughs> right away you're throwing me off. I don't even know what dialectic means. So great question. So yeah, yeah. so uh, let's let's talk about the three parts then. Yeah. All right. So like one of the things I try to do, and just like as a dude sat in his room, right, like, is read re- read a bunch of things, identify which people are on average better at like surfacing insights or have a view of something highly unusual. And I'm finding actually quite rarely those people are intellectuals. They're kind of like at the weirder end of the spectrum. And then when you notice like a lot of overlap between their ideas and these kind of either archetypal or fractal patterns, start to pay attention to that. And like the risk is always you're going to go into this overfitting where you're like the moment you see a pattern, you're going to find it everywhere. But this pattern and I haven't read any Hegel, so I don't know where or, where or when it applies, although I have heard of that cadence before. The worst part of this pattern is that there isn't even a particularly good metaphor that I've found yet to, to explain it. So there are like a bunch of like crappy metaphors. The one that Ian McGilchrist uses in his book, which quick plug there, masterpiece, it's called The Matter With Things, I could talk all day about that. But he talks about the brain's hemispheres where you take in sensory data from your right hemisphere and it's kind of like a jumble mishmash. You then categorize it with the left hemisphere so that you can kind of orient yourself in the world. And then you check it again against the right hemisphere to see whether the model of the world you've you've made is accurate. And a lot of like modern society basically stops at the analytical stage and they don't test to see whether their map matches reality. And I guess the way this, this pattern is interesting is that it's constantly about this interplay between map and territory. Like, how is your model of the world bumping up against how the world actually is? Because if you have this internal model of the world that's wrong, it's basically the source of, like, most psychopathologies, where, like, I'm a shitty person and everything I do is terrible, and it's never going to get better, and everything I do is a result of me being a terrible person. That's, like, quite a good description of depression. Or, like, you have this view that your drinking problem isn't particularly severe, you're destroying everything in your life around you, 
And then suddenly you have this moment of realization or this moment of clarity where you're like, oh my God, I'm an alcoholic. You know, the, the, that's what AA people talk about all the time. So you have this, this kind of dissonance period where you're like, wow, oh my God, things don't quite fit together. And the thesis of my paper is that essentially we are in this dissonance point at the moment where because McGilchrist thinks are like analytical, like abstracted intellectual left hemisphere is taking control. It's setting us up in dissonance with the world as it's flowing around us. And that's creating all these secondary effects of like nihilism, a meaning crisis, you know, mental illness, suicide, all these horrible things that are happening because our internal model of the world as it's being created by society is not matching up against the way the world actually works. Does that kind of sort of make sense? Yeah. I think it, it definitely makes it. I mean, as we, as we talk about all these large ideas, it's hard for it to make sense. Uh, but like you use it as a, a map. You're starting to get into that. And we were talking about from different uh, perspectives and the tension and everything. So maybe let's, let's go back for a second. What's that STS map like for short? Like, what does that actually mean? Like explain STS. Let's start there. Simplicity tension synthesis. So basically you have this simplicity, which is the data as it comes in. Then you have this tension phase where it's like, all right, is the analysis that I'm coming up with of this outside information accurate? And then you have the synthesis stage where you take your model of the world as, it, as it's come to you and as you've assembled it, and then you compare it back against the world again. And that synthesis stage is sort of the, the resolution of both your model of the world and the world as you've conceived it. And not to overcomplicate things too early on, there's something about that final stage that creates something new. And people talk about this all the time, and it's not, it's something I don't think I understand fully, but it's there's something about the world being perceived and having been run through our analytical filters that brings something new into the world that might just be as simple as your individual perspective. But there's there's clearly a very deep idea in that synthesis stage that I haven't quite got my arms around yet. And I know you draw a lot or heavily from Miguel Chris, but I want to like address something kind of right at the beginning is like. McGill Chris, you know, talking about hemispheres of mind and like by bi or bicameral mind, that's more of a like an intuition pump because a lot of people are just going to ignore that right away because they think that's kind of been debunked. But like, is don't you think of it as more of an intu intuition pump of a thinking about the world through analytic and then creative <laughs> models? Or like, how would like what's another way of, of putting McGill Chris model? Yeah, I, I mean, not to not to go back again, like the thing about the McGill Chris model is that what he always says is that the idea that the the two sides of the brain do different things is wrong, but the idea that they do them in different ways is right. So like the pop psychology of you having like a creative side of the brain is wrong, but the idea that because they don't do, they do different things in different ways, uh, isn't radically, radically do, do the same thing in different ways, isn't radically important. Um, I guess the, the intuition pump to use your term that has been most effective, um, that explaining his thesis very quickly is the bird thing where basically he's like a bird is pecking the ground and is trying to find whether a grain is a piece of sand or a piece of grain that it can eat right and it uses the left hemisphere to kind of break down the the local environment to a very granular basis quite literally to work out what it can eat right that's the predatory side at the same time you have the right hemisphere continuously scanning for cats right watching the world for patterns trying to look over its shoulder has this very wide understanding of the environment that's kind of somatic and instinctive and intuitive and the idea is that like both of them should be working together at all times right that's why we have oppositional processing um i guess if you want to take away extrapolate the bird pecking analogy to like what's actually relevant for you and me it's that when the bird looks down at the ground and, and starts dividing the world up into grains, right? That's what we do when we interact with the world, that we look at the world and we see cars, we see apples, we see, you know, pizzas, we see things that we can interact with. And we, we break the world up in such a way that we can manipulate it. Um, and, and that's made us incredibly powerful. The fact that you and I can have long-winded, pretentious dialogues about these concepts Right. Like that has given us the power to manipulate the world and create space shuttles. But in the Gilchrist view, it's also made us lose a sense of the primacy of that holism, that we actually are a part of the environment we're di dissecting. And that when the left hemisphere thinks it's really smart, lies when questioned 
and doesn't really have a full understanding of the whole. And that already sounds probably pretty familiar to people who are listening about like, you know, overly intellectual academics who are very abstracted, very isolated in their single field of study. They don't have this holism sense. And I think that when the thing that really brought it home for me when McGill Chris was talking, he was like, all right, like, let's back away from all of this nonsense. If the left hemisphere was in charge, what kind of world would it create? It would create this world where everything's digitally abstracted so that instead of sex, you get porn. Instead of really good social relationships, you get social media. Instead of adventure, you get, you know, movies about adventure, right? And you get these grid-like cities where everything is very isolated from nature. Everything's incredibly safe. You know, more people now die from obesity than malnutrition. We've created these incredibly safe worlds where we feel very, very disconnected and very bored and very isolated. And I find that very compelling. Initially, when I first read it, I was like, that sounds like bullshit to me. That sounds like, how are you abstract? How are you extrapolating from neurology to the structure of the world? And then you realize that actually the causality there isn't totally clear. And that imbalance, start. you start to notice that imbalance everywhere. So trying to, to me, like thinking about the hemisphere sense, and let's just keep using that metaphor, Mm. To me, is it fair? Like, I, I think about the old phrase, like, man's at war with himself. Like, we have a both animal nature and then we have a societal nature, and those are typically in conflict with each other. But in a sense, I, you would say that the left hemisphere is the societal nature, and then the right hemisphere is like our animal nature. Or am, I, or am I overly simplifying? I don't think so. And I don't really know that, you know, like there's all this kind of lizard brain stuff about, you know, how far up Maslow's hierarchy are you before you can start to concentrate on proper things. And I've never seen that really as part of the argument at all um, in terms of whether one side is more primal and one side isn't, right? Like, I think the way that I've looked at it is one side is more predator. Um, and that predatory nature in us is actually incredibly sophisticated or at least it sounds incredibly sophisticated because it's incredibly articulate the left hemisphere has far greater access to language and syntax and logic and linearity and so it's it's like you know the slightly aspie guy that that sounds incredibly smart and probably runs all the largest companies in the world but also lacks an understanding of how that company is going to destroy its ecosystem around us. So it's it's sort of, I guess it's primal in the sense that it doesn't know as much as it thinks it knows, but it's not primal in that it sounds incredibly sophisticated. And I, I would argue a lot of like left hemisphere, like, like imbalanced people actually kind of run our world. They just don't understand their own limitations. There's a great, great anecdote from McGilchrist where he talks about when people who's right hemispheres have been knocked out by strokes um, get told that they can't use their arm on the opposite side and when the right hemisphere gets um, it, when you can only operate from your light hemisphere that doesn't lie people are like oh yeah yeah my arm's totally paralyzed that's crazy isn't it right the right hemisphere never ever lies um, Michael Gazaniga, who does um, uh, most of the split brain research, says it's the most remarkable finding from split brain research is that the right brain is totally truthful but when the left brain is in control if you say to it, oh, by the way, dude, your arm's knocked out, they'll be like, no, it isn't. And then when you show them they can't use their arm, they'll be like, oh, that's not my arm. That's some dude over there. And so you have this nature where like one side of the brain lies and lies, it, it confabulates constantly. I think because from an evolutionary perspective, it was more important to be right quickly than to take a long time deliberating and be wrong. But that, that kind of really muddies the water in terms of primal needs versus longer term needs, I think. Yeah, that's where I, we'll dive into that muddiness because that's where I kind of broke down. But it reminds me, like, our psychological immune systems are so strong, right? Like, they just yeah. want that dissonance. So it'll, it'll do anything it can. And I would assume that I would presume that the argument for uh, left hemisphere dominant is is uh, just a full advent of, like, the enlightenment and specialization in the world. And we've just been dramatically moving in that direction. Is that the, the basic argument on a linear basis? Precisely. And the causality is weird. Like, why did that happen? When did that happen? Yeah. Is it, you know, like on a, the argument on my paper is it, it might have been necessary. This might be a necessary intermediary stage. It might be the T of the tension stage. Right. It, but, you know, McGilchrist makes a couple of points that like he believes there's no um, accounts of autism or schizophrenia in the scientific literature before about 1800, that these are effectively products of industrialization and specialization that 
we are now we are now we are now thinking people. We have been employed in mostly thinking jobs, and that has kind of dragged us slowly into the left hemisphere. And if you think about who we reward predominantly in our society, it's coders, it's engineers, it's people that have mastered abstraction, like hedge fund managers and you know metaverse people, whatever you want to call it. So how do you but how do you square that? Like you're saying, when you look through the historical literature, you don't get that much evidence for like schizophrenia or depression, et cetera. It's like uh, like the idea of what measures get managed or like we say, I think I was later on in your article is something about um, self-reported studies from kids in the last two decades is the highest level of depression. It's like is it goes back to like maybe uh, Homer in the wine dark sea, like we didn't use the color blue. Like how much do you how do you how do you caveat that with like we haven't had the, these longitudinal studies don't go back centuries. Right. We don't have good reported data. So maybe maybe we just weren't talking about those things. We we talked about in different ways that you wouldn't see represented in the literature from the 17th or 18th century. T totally fair. McGill Chris does address that though. In that he says okay. that he says that basically there are plenty of accounts of depression and mania, and you know things that things that may not meet the DSM, but like are actually like plausible and fairly accurately related to the things that we experience today. It's just that autism and schizophrenia are absent, and the whole part of the first part of his magnum opus is about society has basically become autistic and schizophrenic. Um, uh, writ large but the depression angle is an important one in the this is very simplistic but I believe that depression can sometimes be caused by the tension stage that basically as I was alluding to earlier you have this very fixed model of yourself where you basically become a closed system resistant to all outside information and as a result you start to eat yourself and you start to go into this sort of this negative feedback loop where you can't update your model with any new information. So like, I think that depression is related to this, but it's not something that's being, it's not, it's being caused by the left hemisphere imbalance, but in a very different way from schizophrenia and autism. Have you found too, it made me think about like a lot of times I think about the just Alex static bands and maybe the British philosopher John Gray talked about we're always oscillating between liberalism and barbarism. And I just <laughs> wonder like maybe historically, the, the, and as I say, we have like, oh, we have homostasis, we have homeostasis that's barely, a, and then allostatic bands are large swings. So I just wonder like how much is of that is predicated upon like societal wealth in certain parts of like the world, right? And so maybe during during these times of extreme societal wealth, when we don't, when we're moving much more towards abstraction and specialization, historically, is that maybe where you saw depression or autism? And maybe you don't see it when we get back to maybe, you know, just subsistence living or something like that. It's just something that popped into my head. I'm wondering if you found anything when you were reading about it ish right like i'm not really a am not really a civilizational expert john glove was this guy that did this this apparently this huge series of civilizational decline and he found that the era of intellect was basically the the, the, the peak um whether you looked at any previous civilizations i think one of the weaknesses of well, yeah, you know, I, I hesitate to say weaknesses but one of the things i struggle with over my girl chris argument is the lack of data points right in terms of like this society definitely screwed it up for this yeah. reason there's a lot of myths though and the myths is where i really gravitate to because i'm like just a monster myth person and like i th you see this everywhere once you start to see it which is I guess the most famous one would be the Lion King, where you basically have, you know, Simba, you have Scar over, overtake Mufasa, the environment starts to fall apart, and then Simba comes and reclaims his birthright. But the Scar figure is super interesting in that it appears to be a relatively archetypal pattern that you have this very sophisticated intellectual figure that overthrows the rightful king, and then everything goes to shit. Um, and you see that all over the place. And I think that that's very interesting to me. And McGill Chris talks about an Iroquois legend about which has exactly the same thesis that the, the moment you have this kind of usually British, uh, like mad scientist figure or whatever, like, like the Eminence Grise overtakes the, the rightful king, Jafar and Aladdin or whatever it is, right? Things immediately go to shit. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. Whether we've seen that in enough societies, whether we can prove that the Egyptians were hemispherically balanced, whether we can improve that, in, improve that indigenous societies were had different centers of cognition, that's harder to do. It's something I'm super interested in. Though. I just it, it threw me off at a tangent there for a second. Have you ever read, uh, read "Don't Sleep There, Snakes" about the Badahan tribe in yeah, Brazil? Yeah, yeah. About yeah, like, yeah. they don't have any origin myths or anything. They throw like everything we think about of. Uh, you know, like uh, whether we're a tableau or rasa or not and everything we've learned about language, whether it's, you know, we have the framework, you know, and, you know, intrinsically or not, 
is kind of fascinating how they kind of like it's the one example where people don't have a lot of these myths and origin myths and everything and whether that's true or not it's just always a it's an interesting that's almost outside the box that people don't really it's that outlier effect it's almost like a you know, as, as we deal in finance and stuff, it's people like now do Japan, right? If Japan throws your system or, <laughs> or, or we start talking about uh, uh, smoking and eating fatty foods and obesity, it's like now do France, right? Like the Badajo yeah. tribe of Brazil yeah. is like kind of like throws everything for a wrench. I just well, wonder if you re read that in general. But then. Maybe not, right? Like, so I've, when I went fully nuts, uh, which I've done several times now, um, I became like obsessed with the Pirahan. Um, and so, like to to listeners that aren't as weird as us, uh, which is probably all of them. Um, <laughs> the the, the Pirahan are a tribe, a very small, sadly now tribe in the Amazon that basically don't have very many abstract terms. Um, and they they got really famous because a Christian missionary went and tried to convert them and was like, "So this is guy Jesus?" And they were like, "Have you met him?" He's like, "No." And they were like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> and kind of immediately <laughs> kind of immediately lost interest. And um, and anthropologists have basically described them as there's one of the happiest tribes they've ever known until they gave them alcohol, at which point things kind of went <laughs> bad. Um, but um, the, one of the things that I find, well, I think one of the reasons why I got obsessed with them um, and I didn't know it at the time was that basically they don't have abstract words and therefore they live entirely in the present. And they can do that because they're hunter gatherers. They literally, you know, don't look more than a couple of days out. And they, when anything leaves their field of vision, it, it you know, seems like it ceases to exist, right? So they're completely in the flow. And I think that there's a lesson here that relates back to the Miguel Chris stuff that is like, it, it is, I think, a universal law that the more abstract you get, the less happy that you are. And you can look at this actually in a relatively scientific way that people that have had their right hemisphere knocked out, like, like serious schizophrenics, report that time doesn't pass. It's a bit like Groundhog Day. Like they literally describe it as Groundhog Day, where time just goes in this endless loop and it seems like there's no progress or flow to it. It's something that I actually experienced for a couple of years when I got like mega, mega depressed. And I believe that I was like fully in the left hemisphere. And in the right hemisphere, you have this amazing example of Jill Bolt Taylor, who was a neuroanatomist who had her whole left hemisphere knocked out in a massive stroke. And she describes it as Nirvana where she's completely at one with everything, right? Completely in the flow, but is so is so in the flow that she can't abstract herself enough to dial an ambulance, right? So like, it, like, it, like neither of these extremes are desirable, although one feels very pleasant. It is kind of interesting to me that we do have an understanding of how it feels. And when I look at the Pirahan, it's like, we don't have any abstractions and therefore we're blindingly happy all the time. Like we can't go back to being the Pirahan, but there's a lesson there for us. And there's so many things I want to pull out of there. Like you said, if somebody goes full on right hemisphere, like I always say, that's the idea of Satori or Nirvana or enlightenment is if you can go full on that side and I'm like, yeah, but then you wouldn't be able to take a shit in a toilet or eat. <laughs> like you, would, like, you, you have no emotional context for right. like, cho for choice, right? Choice is based on emotion. And then the other thing that I pull on for the Bihahan is like, not only is like, their language has that simple simplicity of present tense and the amount of like just even words they use. But like a, a prime example of what you're referring to is like even when the uh, women weave baskets to catch fish in, they have like this loose weave that only works for like when you catch one fish and then it's a part because <laughs> they don't they don't like weave baskets like for the future like that would be like a good system. But at the same time, like you said, it, it was all relatively good until they introduced alcohol. You know when people were coming up the river, like when the Brazilians came up the river, and it reminds me. And this is actually this uh, this is actually a data point for your uh, thesis and, and throughout this paper, and I'm sure you've seen this, is like, you know, when they, they rate like the Nepalese, like the happiest people in the world, um, except for then when they go and uh, find the people because they've, <laughs> they've tried to keep on the uh, traditional side of things and they've tried to eliminate the internet and TV. But then when they found on the fringes, people that are hooking up illegal satellites and getting internet and TV, like all of it kind of falls apart. So that, oh. that goes into your thing of abstraction is like, it depends on like who you are, uh, who, who, you, who is filling out that survey. And is that, and how much they you know they're it's kind of the rhetoric they're trying to have at the government level is that no we're eliminating all these things and we're having a traditional society but then on the fringes obviously everybody wants that and I, I'm sure people have heard me say this a million times there's a point when I lived in central Mexico and it always fascinated me that the uh, the local like the locals are one thing and then you had all of these expats and Starbucks was coming into the community and they were they redid and read they. They took a historic building. They did an amazing job of renovation. And the entire time, the expats were were trying to boycott it. They were marching and signs saying, don't bring Starbucks here and everything. And then the day Starbucks opened, there was lines around the block 
of the local Mexicans that wanted to have Starbucks. And it was, it became this aspirational quality thing and they had date nights and everything. And it just, it's always seated in my mind, those ideas too, of like, we want them to have like the traditional folklore and everything, I guess, so we can take pictures, but they want the aspirational qualities of the life we have. And who are we to tell them like, you can't have Starbucks and that it might ruin their life when it's like, they clearly wanted Starbucks and they spoke with their, their wallets and lines around the block. It, it's impossible, right? Like we're not going back. Um, yeah. And you know, like I was, I was reading Fat Club Smell's book a, a, a few months ago and he's just like, yeah, if you, if developing countries get a 10th of China's growth in the last 20 years, they're going to be, a, it's going to be like a 10 X in the number of cars and a 40 X in the number of air conditions. And that's a slightly different topic, but it's just like, who are we to go into their societies and be like, that's nah, monsoon season, but you can't have an air conditioner because climate change, right? Like yeah. you know, it's, it's ludicrous. I think that like the longer time goes on, I just think about the Amish where I'm like, the Amish are really, really, really considered about what technologies they allow into their community. And I don't know much about the Amish, but I just like that concept, right? Or like the digital Sabbath, like these traditional ways of keeping us a little bit separate from that technology, or at least like monitoring monitoring our use of it. Um, and I'm pretty optimistic about the way that technology goes over sort of the next 10 to 20 years, because I think we're all kind of aware of, of like where we've got to. Um, and I actually think kind of the broader picture here is like, if you read McGilchrist stuff, he's like, we're all doomed. You know, like he's, he, you know, his his recent pronouncements are like, we this is an existential threat to society, and he believes it. And I and I think that he's right to believe it in certain ways. But then when you look at it from another perspective, it's like all of this stuff has given us the power of gods, right? you know, to, to, to butcher the quote, right? We now have, we, we have this godlike power, but no understanding of the whole, right? We have no understanding of, uh, of, of how these powers can be used. You've just handed a, a toddler a handgun. Um, and as a result, it's mayhem. But the idea is from a lot of people that I found very inspirational is that like the left hemisphere will eventually be returned to the guidance of the right. There will be this synthesis stage whether it is unfortunate, it usually is caused by a crisis, right? By this this frictional dissonance point, and how bad that frictional dissonance point is, whether it's ahead of us, whether it whether it's behind us, whether the world whether the world wars with that, who knows, right? There is typically this transition point where suddenly you go into the right hemisphere, going back in charge of the left, and then we'll have all these abilities, this incredible technology, this analytical intelligence. It will just be used in a much wiser way. And I, I think like there's all, I'm probably going in too many different directions here, but the, there is an idea that came out of the piece, which is that evolution does not go backwards in one sense, which is that the level and scope of human cooperation gets larger and larger over time. You have this, this whole on idea where things just get more complex and more integrated over time. And that direction of travel implies that we're just going to get more and more conscious over time, like not in a linear trajectory, but we're going to get more complex, more integrated and more cooperative over time, which is consistent with this synthesis stage. So like, yeah, there's all this dumb stuff out there, but I think the dumb stuff will eventually be redeployed in a much more positive way. You're actually doing a great job of bringing us back on task. It's <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, this is just all tangents. And I, I serendipitously, I'm a actually in Pennsylvania yeah. right now, very close to Amish, like Lancaster, you know, country. And but have you ever heard of Rumspringa? Like where they get the year no, off? This, this no. is great. So when they're coming of age, like in late teens, early 20s, it's called Rumspringa. They're allowed a year off to go out and be in regular society and use technology and all that to see if then they want to come back. Can you imagine? What that's like after like 20 years of being in like in, in an Amish society getting dropped one year into like 2022 and then deciding if you want to come back like I be mean, that's 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 really disorientating and then obviously I would think you know I would guess probabilistically you want to come back just because that one year is just so disorientating in general and only a few people could handle that amount of chaos in their brain like it's just it's just mind-boggling to me. There's this bananas book called Nothing to Envy about um, North Korea. Very, very clever title. Uh, and basically, there's all these stories about, like, you've grown up in North Korea and you've been told that basically the world is a disaster and everyone else is savages. <laughs> and all these people that managed to make it into South Korea, right, when people are, like, a foot taller than them because of nourishment and, right, like, and South Korea, like, the most technologically advanced country on Earth, pretty much, right? And so the level of dissonance that you have when you suddenly come out of North Korea into South Korea, it must be like Rumspringer for these guys. 
So I wanted to bring us back as you were to the simplicity, tension, and in synthesis. I'm never going to be able to pronounce that easily. <laughs> it's like and 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 where we get there. But there was I want to go back to the beginning where we we're talking about a little bit about uh, where it gets muddled a little bit, and that's why I was using the analogy. And this is where it got muddled for me. So hopefully you can help me help me unmuddle myself, so to speak. Is that you know when I started to say I was thinking about left and right hemisphere, and I started thinking that man's at war with himself in the sense that you know we have the animal nature and then we have societal nature, and they uh, they frequently conflict. And so when I think about that left hemisphere and that societal nature, you know, it's telling you to do all these abstract things, right? That may go against your animal self and what you feel you should naturally do. So where I started to have, and this is maybe my own, it's, it is my own personal, like intellectual dyslexia, is this, and I got turned around reading your piece, is that to me, the idea, if the left hemisphere is the societal implications, like telling you what you should do, I guess, epigenetically, if you were looking at the other part genetically, is like, that part is telling you to cooperate and maybe your animal self is telling you to be predatory. And so do you see where I almost got flipped mm -hmm. around and that's why I, it started to get really muddled for me. So like unmuddle me, help me, help me out of this like scenario. Yeah. Um, it's the opposite um, where the left hemisphere is concerned with individuation and self-regard um, and the right hemisphere is concerned with cooperation because it's holistic, right? Like it, it literally has a sense for the whole. And that is, I believe, true when you knock those hemispheres out. So basically, the left hemisphere, you need to think of as a drive for, for necessary individuation and ego. And the, the right hemisphere is a drive to be part of the whole. So like, I don't see either of them as like primal. And I think that's misleading, or at least it's not something that I've taken from, from the books. It's just one of them is pulling you towards higher individuality and individuation and all the good and bad things that come with that. You know, strong ego, action in the world, really decisive, able to navigate yourself around, you know, able to call an ambulance if you have a stroke, like all of these really highly necessary things. And I, I think one of the criticisms of the book is that you could overly demonize that side of you when analytical intelligence is phenomenal and like individualism is phenomenal. It just, it shouldn't be the the, the, de the, the final point. The right hemisphere is in McGilchrist's sense though, superior in almost every sense in terms of its ability to come to an understanding of the world, at least in his terms. And it's just got a much better nuanced understanding of the way you should be navigating yourself in the world because it's actually connected to the world. It's much more connected to your heart. It's much more connected to your body. And so one of my central beliefs is that external input is more important than your model of the world. You should be constantly updating your model of the world based on external input. And so if you let that left-hand side drive, it's going to drive you into walls. And it's not even going to tell you it's driving into walls because one of its, one of its main faults is certainty. One of the things before I get back to the iterative feedback is I'm curious, and, and this might actually might lead to your uh, synthesis thesis, is that, um, you know, when I think about cells in our body, right, every every cell in your body is uh, hell-bent on individual survival, but it cooperates with the cells around it to achieve that individual survival. So is that kind of like, because so I'm trying to think of that cooperation versus predatory, where it's like individualization combined with the group dynamic, does, is that what creates synthesis or is like or am i thinking about that even no you're, you've absolutely nailed it yeah so like um another plug here this guy brett anderson who i recently discovered wrote a piece called intimations of a new worldview that's like a 90 minute long essay on his Substack, and it's one of the most brilliant things i've ever read um and he talks about this concept that i fully don't understand yet but it's like it's on my list for this week funny enough of things which is that as things become more complex, they become both more individuated and more integrated. And he used this literally the example you just came out with of a, of a cell in your body. But I guess the, the metaphor that I found I could understand a bit better was like, if, if you have a, a village, right, of 150 people, and you the village is kept relatively stable in sort of a positive sum game, everyone can then to start start to specialize in that village. So you end up with a blacksmith, a weaver, a shopkeeper, because everyone can start to, to occupy their niche in a more efficient way without having to do everything or worried they're going to get a spear through the face any second, right? And so you get this increasingly individuated but increasingly into integrated society. So it sort of solves the paradox. And I don't, I'm sure there's much, much more to this idea. It's been playing on my brain in the way that like these kind of big ideas do, but it is precisely what you just said. But as, as so maybe this is, uh, we're front running your next, uh, your next piece, but I, yeah. it, makes me, it makes me think about, like you're saying is as information becomes more abundant, more prevalent, we become more specialized, um, you know, we become more complex. 
is then what overlay does like the internet in general provide where we feel like even though we're playing more complex specialized roles, we see more clearly how we're like connecting to parts of the whole. Like what I think about all the time is the blue marble photo of the planets, 1972. And to me, like all the environmental movement and stuff now is just 40 to 50 years of having that photo where like maybe before we didn't think about it quite so subconsciously that this is our, this is our, we're on this lot together. And maybe the internet is helping that too. So like maybe there's the overlay of like, as we become more complex and individuated, like you're saying, or specialized, we still always have these overarching things about a, a singular planet or maybe the internet and the combinations thereof. Mm, I, there's two interesting things here. First of which is that I think what the internet does in its purest, most positive sense is it gives you the ability to pursue that niche. So like it's a radically more rich information landscape than anything we've ever discovered, right? So my ability to chase down these rabbit holes relative to 20 years ago is like unfathomable. And I'll meet someone like you that I love, right? And we'll go out and we'll have a dialogue, right? And I'll get smarter as a result of that dialogue. So it's like this crazy accelerant. As long as the thing that's driving you is your curiosity, right? And you're not constantly being driven off by, by algos, right? Trying to take you to something that's profitable, but not actually interesting to you. So there's this tension there where like the Web3 model is like, all right, I'm going to meet people I love and they're going to show me things that they love. And it's just going to be a, a beautiful rabbit hole fest that's going to rapidly accelerate my development. That will make me both more individual and also more integrated because I'll feel like I'm not competing with other people, except in a very benign way. And I'm essentially getting wiser. And that leads to the second thing. And this is one of these other concepts that's really only come out over the last few weeks, which is this concept of relevance realization, which is that, um, to the blue marble, right? Like the blue marble is like an overview effect, right? Like the astronauts report getting when they go into space where they suddenly see the whole picture. And there's something about wisdom that is being able to zoom in and zoom out and break your frame very quickly. And it's something John Viveki, who I think is probably the best person right now on wisdom has talked about like the shaman would literally have this ability to break frame and go out and see things from an overview. It's where the word overview comes from. And then he could narrow back in again and see whether his attention was focused on the right place, or whether the group's attention was focused on the right place. So that you have these, you have this kind of weird combination of things where people can use the internet to focus very, very narrowly on things that are very specifically their niche in a way that they couldn't before. And you also have the ability to take a much wider perspective that allows people to kind of zoom in and out and make sure they're focused on the right things. Do those two thing, kind of concepts kind of hang together? Yeah, I was just pulling it up because that's actually a STS map, right? Simplicity yeah. intention th synthesis. And you're using like zoom in, zoom out and all that stuff. It's ever the one thing that threw me off for a second is like, maybe it's my perversity, but like the, all this stuff just gives me like cosmic insignificance is the way I think about it. When I see blue marble or, or, or I take a, a broader view, it just kind of makes me see like, what's the point of anything? Well, funny enough, um, there's a new book called The Romance of Reality that, that takes the other side of that. And Brett's piece cites it quite heavily. I'm reading it at the moment. It's good. Um, it's all right. So let's look at it from a very selfish perspective. The goal of evolution is to get better at playing positive sum games so that you get more correlated with your environment. If you're a bacterium that keeps swimming in the wrong direction, you're going to get selected against really quickly. And so the idea is, is that you get to this perfect point which can obviously never be achieved where like the tiniest amount of egoic left hemisphere, left hemisphere effort has the maximum amount of result. You have almost no gap between map and territory. You're just swimming through the world with perfect ease. That's sort of the view of this Taoist sage. The idea being that like, the more integrated you get as a person, the more complex you become, your model of the world gets really, really, really clear but also you get incredibly efficient at acting in it. You can basically see the world super clearly, but navigate the world incredibly efficiently. So it's, it's like this weird combination of perfect high leverage individual action and this beautiful right hemisphere view of everything. So like the Taoist sage clicks his fingers and starts a thunderstorm, right? That's the sort of the apex cliche behind it, right? And so why do we matter? Because if you can get to that apex stage, you can have a cascading positive impact on the system that like when you talk to like physicists or the, the, the Santa Fe guys, they're like, wow, everything's a complex adaptive system. And you're like, yes, but you have more agency than a piece of sand or a butterfly. So when you're perfectly correlated to the system, you can have this incredibly positive cascading effect. And because we are the most sentient things that we know of 
in the known universe. And the brain is the most complex thing that we know of in the known universe. That gives us the most creative agency of anything we know of, right? It gives us both for good and for bad. And we've mostly just seen for bad, right? It gives us this crazy propensity and ability to create. God, there's so many things. But the problem is when you, as soon as you say something, I'm like, think it makes me think of like 10 things. So I'm trying to, I'm going to try to tie it together because there are so many things you want, you said in there I want to pull on. And I, I, I can't help it. These are my, as you know, in, in private, my natural proclivities for things like that. We have agency. It's just my mind kind of breaks with that because like, as you brought up evolution, what's interesting, and I'm glad you brought up bacteria because like the question is evolutionary. When you say evolution's desire or need, as you know, I'm, and I'm not putting you on the spot, it's like, evolution doesn't have a desire need or, or a teleological end goal, right? Evolution is really uh, actually malad maladaptation is where we actually move in evolutionary st structures and you know, advance, so to speak, if there is any sort of th such thing as advancement, advancement, I'd be very careful in choosing my words. But like with bacteria, even like for human beings, how do we know we're not just carriers of this microbiome and it's genetic coding? And that's our actual evolution is just to carry on our microbiota and the, the ancient evolution that you find in the ATP cycles. So part of it makes me wonder then with agency, like you're saying, even in that complex adaptive system, you know, do we have agency or that's the zooming out, zooming in, and maybe we're like, where we think we have agency in that. And what, where I'm trying to go to here is because I want to bring us back to the iterative feedback loops. Because if if you're getting this, you know, map territory iterative feedback loop, how do you pull back just to make sure the solipsism of that? Because once again, solipsism makes us think that the evolution is for our own benefits and that we have agency. That all of that's liberated to solipsism. So when you're getting the map and territory and iterative feedback, you think you're getting somewhere, but maybe the overarching view is maybe you have the wrong ideas. So like how mm -hmm. do you how do you like did you see what I'm saying? Like where I'm trying yeah, to yeah, yeah. like Yeah, I think I think you can overthink this in a lot of ways. And Christ almighty, am I guilty of that most days? Um, <laughs> that makes two of us, for sure. <laughs> if anybody's gotten this far and hasn't tuned in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for this. I'm here for this. Um, does it feel good, right? Like, I think that's, like, we can look at, like, the, the teleology of it or are we here just as a carrier for a microbiome or any of this stuff right like what's interesting is i was reading a, this morning i was reading a 30-year meta study of wisdom research and they were like doesn't correlate with age or intelligence particularly strongly what it does correlate with is hedonic and eudaimonic well-being but like the better you get at relevance realization like the better your life goes because you just end up navigating the world much more much more flawlessly and the bit where i'm going to go a bit crazy town is that I do believe the world responds to that in ways in, with a, an intelligence and complexity that isn't typically very well accepted in, in our modern society. But I see it mostly as synchronicities, where basically when you're on the beam and going in the right direction, you will see synchronicities and coincidences and, and cues from the external environment that you're going on in the right direction. And all right, let's call bullshit on all of that and be like, all right, well, what does the opposite look like? The opposite looks like someone that keeps doing the wrong thing. How do you know it's the wrong thing? Because your life will go to shit, right? Like if you're, if, if, and we all know those people intuitively that have a fixed view of themselves that isn't accurate as to the way that other people see them, that have all these internal traumas that stop them seeing the world clearly. One of Brett Anderson's lines, which I thought was great, which is the source of almost all psychopathologies is refusal to pay attention to your own cascading errors, right? That like you pay attention to the wrong things. And when you make mistakes, you don't realize that you're making mistakes. And so you get locked into these negative feedback loops. And I know that because it's happened to me for a very long period of time, where basically you keep letting the left hemisphere drive and it keeps driving you into a tree or whatever metaphor you want. You just haven't updated your models quickly enough. And that literally is the definition of depression. So we can think about all these really big ideas and stuff and how they relate to evolution. But what I've noticed from people around me and having watched the people that are living really good lives and really enjoying themselves, they mostly tend to be following their curiosity. And in this kind of infinite game, positive feedback loop, where the more they focus on things they're interested in or do things that they enjoy, the better they get at it and the better they, the better they get at finding things that they're interested in. And like spookier, weirder things than that, where their lives actually mm. tend to start going better. Well, part of, I want to I want to come back to that for a second, but it was, it made me think that maybe the the count like not a kind of argument counter thesis to that it was almost tying into what you were saying about left hemisphere is like if it's it's really egregious right with the alcoholic the example you gave is like your your tension is like the feedback from the world it's like you're fucking up your life mm. but almost going back to like you said the complexity and over specialization and everything is like actually the feedback loops you're getting from the map and territory are actually positive 
So how do you know that like you might be going down and what you're saying is maybe a net negative path, but you could be going down there for decades because society's on a wrong path. That's what I'm more getting at. It's like, what if the feedback's not quite there from a societal perspective that you're fucking up? But like to, to your point, that may be the wrong direction societally or individually that you're heading in, even though it's getting rewarded by the left hemisphere. Well, dude, that's actually kind of totally my argument, right? <laughs> which is which is that like, why is everyone mega depressed right now despite us having everything that we need, right? And it's basically because the model that we have developed as a Western society of the world is not actually how the world works. And when you read a lot of indigenous wisdom, you're like, oh no, like we've got it all like pretty, pretty radically wrong. And there's like this sense of creeping dissonance that we have, that we are mismatched against our environment. And that is creating this epidemic of mental illness that I think is, is, is messing people up so much. So we're actually, we're kind of like societally the alcoholics in this stage. And I guess like, yeah, I think you can spend the whole of your life as an alcoholic. It's just a question of the level of suffering that you want, and, you know, whether you're a functional alcoholic or whatever. But again, that implies that you're functioning well in the world. The reason why I would bring a counterpoint in there is that the moment of clarity People don't think the moment of clarity is bullshit, right? You don't hear many alcoholics be like, oh, you know, I had this moment of clarity and you know what? I think it's rubbish. I think I, I think I, I don't have a drinking problem, right? Like all spiritual awakenings, people tend to report as more real than real, right? Where they've had this encounter with something that's, that's this kind of this emergent force. And I kind of believe that that's the way this works. And let's give the example of like Iboga, or any of these psychedelics that manage to cure people of alcoholism or heroin addiction in one in one go, because it basically breaks people's maladaptive frames instantaneously and makes them realize that their their habits were wrong. I don't see that process working backwards. I got it. And you would, I mean, you know these things as well, but I think like Anais Nin, like we, we see things not as they are, but we see things as we are, right? And hmm. so like you're saying, like when you see these, uh synchronicities are and, and you see those patterns in your life you know it's impossible to know as you know like uh the numbers are probably wrong but it's directionally correct that like our five senses you know we experience 14 million bits of data a second we're only consciously aware of 16 i mean those mm -hmm. numbers vary but like you generally get the idea so we're essentially putting a, a solipsistic lens on the world or a filter and we only notice the things we want to notice right but at the same time what you're saying and correct me if i'm wrong to me it's like it's a form of placebo effect and i believe placebo is the best medicine by far like there's nothing wrong with placebo effects but like I think what you're saying is like, if you actually, those synchronicities might not be real or exist, but there's, there's no harm in believing they do. If you view that you're on the correct path, is that kind of, no, the it's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying, okay. uh, which is that um, they're extremely real. Um, that I completely subscribe to the viewpoint that you have that like, you know, the, the, the number I heard was you've got 60 bits in your conscious awareness and 11 million in that pool. But then, I think the thing that you can't neglect is that there could be a trillion times more information out there that we're yeah. not evolved to perceive. So the idea that there wouldn't be some forces acting on us that we could not be consciously aware of, I think then becomes a probability, which is a bit of a, a, a bit of a brain scrambling idea. I think that the question with this, like all of these things is, is the calibration of relevance, right? So like John Viveki talks about affordances, which is when you, if you look at a room full of, full of stuff and you see a mug, the mug has a handle on it and that handle says to you that you can reach out and grab that handle and pick up the mug, right? That's what the handle of the mug does. That's an affordance. When we look at the world, if we're wise and have good relevance realization, certain things will stand out to us as salient that we can interact with. And should we continue to interact with those things, will flow in a more seamless way through that information environment. And the question is, is how well calibrated is your balance, right? If you're full right hemisphere, you're going to see handles everywhere. Everything's going to look significant. And, you, you know, you, you probably, like, some people have those experiences in sort of mental illness where, like, everything's a signal from the gods, right? And that makes you non-functional, right? And then if you're, like, hyper, hyper rationalist, you're like, well, nothing means anything. There's no such thing as a meaningful coincidence. And most people I speak to lean heavily in that direction, which is there's no such thing as a synchronicity. And I think where you have to be is in the middle which is that sometimes it's just a coincidence, but sometimes it's a meaningful coincidence. And the answer to when is one, when you're wiser, you'll be able to spell th that it's more meaningful, but also it's somatic, that you'll have this sense in your body, non-intellectual, in your heart or somewhere else, 
that's more intrinsically connected to the right hemisphere where you're like shit that was a that was a serious that was a serious cue from my environment that i need to take very very seriously and those cues from the environment are extremely real in my opinion no this is great i think we're getting to like the same place we just go about it in very different uh, paths <laughs> and like but that's my my point to get to is like this is the trickiest question that we're getting down to like brass tacks is like how do you calibrate to know if it's signal or noise like that's the impossibility right and then on the somatic side i've always wondered this is like how do you know the the somatic response is not driven intellectually through patterns as well like you know like how do you how do you differentiate somatic versus intellectual if if it could be giving you the wrong signals once again how do you get that calibration function attuned to like you said that middle way man i just i can't i can't fathom how you do that yeah i, I mean i've spent two years writing about it and i still have no idea i think there's a there's a whole host of things you can do from a deeply practical basis. And that's kind of what I've been focused on. So Viveki says you need a meditative practice, a contemplative practice and an embodiment practice. So you have, yeah, you know, the meditative practice is like, am I focused on the right thing? And then the contemplative practice zooms back and forth between narrow focus and broad focus. And then the embodiment pra um, practice makes sure that you're kind of well tuned into navigating the world and i'm not going to go through it right now but i i turned it into a constructive metaphor about a man and a snake in a jungle where anyone that's listening uh, listening to this can go and see the talking serpent where i kind of discuss that um i think there's also a way that if you pursue things that are interesting to you you get better and better and better the more you the more you cultivate that sense of what is interesting to you at navigating that information landscape in three dimensions or even four dimensions right like you like you just get a better taste and sense for what interests you like i get recommended like five books a week at minimum and sometimes i'll just be like mm, that one that one and i don't know what i'm not reading right but it's it takes me down very very interesting rabbit holes where stuff just grips my attention from the outside world and i think understanding that the outside world is signaling to you is a big part of that and i think the other thing that i've run into which is probably the meta skill is boundary practices of conscious and unconscious that if those 14 million or 11 million bits are out there all the time the only thing that matters is your filter right? What are you getting the right 60 bits through that filter? And having a good relationship with your unconscious is part of that. So being able to calibrate your own emotions. Am I feeling this emotion right now? And why? The George Soros back pain cliche, right? Like he knew when he had back pain, his portfolio was out of whack. He didn't take an ad bill. He knew what it meant, right? Um, or like knowing what time of day you get insights. For me, it's like first thing in the morning or cold showers, like those cliches. Like those embodiment practice and cliches kind of work. And what they do is they gradually improve your relevance realization so that you get better at navigating the world. And I think getting that kind of Taoist balance up. No, I was actually going to say, like, when you're talking about the book choices, it's like a Taoist balance, as you just said. But like, what do you think, though, I was going to bring up like that it is a Taoist balance and that's a Taoist way of going through life. But what do you think when the Taoists say the Tao is not for everybody? Like very few people can handle trying to navigate life with that balance. I think your argument, not to speak for you, would be that like your left hemisphere is the one yelling at you that you shouldn't be living that way. You need to ignore it. Dude, I mean, it's uh, funny enough, um, the Infinite Loops guys were like super crazy, unbelievably flattering and did like an analysis of, well, like a synthesis of all my work the other day. And the dude that wrote, that wrote the synthesis, like at one point wrote like questions. And one of them was just like, isn't this all like, you know, I'm being unfair to him, but kind of isn't this all for rich people, right? Like, yeah. you know, like if you're far enough up Maslow's hierarchy that you can have these, you know, you know, slightly douchey conversations. Like, why is this stuff relevant to you? And I think about that all the time, which is that, you know, like if you're working a dishwashing job or three jobs because you have to, like, does any of this stuff matter? Will you be able to achieve that Taoist balance in your life? Like what, what level, what level of subsistence does this stop at? And the answer is I don't really care because my audience is typically people that, that have enough, Right. And, and enough, I think, is a highly relative thing, but it starts quite low for most people. Right. Like, I don't believe the 75 grand a year number, particularly if you live in Manhattan, but like after a certain level, like you've got enough. And so it's right. How do you flourish after that point? And what's nuts about all the wisdom literature is how closely it correlates to flourishing. So it's just like people we tend to focus on intellectual stuff to the exclusion of anything else. 
but the wisdom stuff has the tightest correlation to flourishing. And therefore, I think it's one of the most important things to pay attention to. And actually, you know, us just miscategorizing this or simplifying it is I would actually push back against that general opinion is it's actually because uh, I felt both sides of the same coin. It's actually it's not just for the ultra rich. It's actually for the ultra poor, too. I say it in this way is like uh, I've lived in California as both. And uh, you either want to be really poor or really rich in California. The in-between is the nightmare because like, <laughs> the, you actually are provided for on all the baseline needs if you're like at a subsistence level in California, but both health care, food, ex- shelter, clothes, et cetera. Um, and then and then if you're ultra rich, obviously you can afford California. It's the in between that's the nightmare when you're trying to make ends meet and you don't have time for this nav- navel gazing, so to speak. So people always push back. It's only for the rich. I, I'm not so certain. And as we know, as all the, you know, traditions out of the East is is primarily for me- you know wandering mendicants. You know, it's like it's it's the ultra poor. So it's not just for the ultra rich. It's more that in between when you're part of that society and you're trying to have, you know, that you're living in a middle class dystopia and you're trying to make ends meet. That's when it's really hard to have these discussions and you're like. Bro, you're not helping me at all here. <laughs> but I want I want to go back to the so the idea like with the simplicity tension synthesis is what I was trying to get at too is um you know when I was thinking about these allostatic bands you know the or or John Gray's liberalism and barbarism part of what I wonder is like that framing like you have even if I do agree with it is like how do you know over the next few decades what society is going to look like and by trying to go maybe more right hemisphere you're limiting your ability to thrive in a left left hemisphere world. Well, your first point's exactly correct. It's a phase shift which follows power laws, which means you, by definition, you don't know when the phase shift comes, right? Like, but you know what precedes the phase shift, which is what's called a frustrated state, right? This dissonance where, like, there's this tension that builds up, a bit like tectonic plates. And a bit like in tectonic plates, you can't predict when an earthquake comes. You just know it's going to follow a power law when it does, right? Which is a bit nuts because pairbacks how nature works thesis does actually apply to all these ideas which is kind of bonkers um so like yeah no no idea like and it's the biggest weakness of this thesis which is like yeah 300 years from now great who cares (laughs) right and but the fact that it's not the the strongest part of the thesis is the fact that it's so unbelievably applicable to individuals and that like all of the principles of the model and this relevance realization and this wisdom acquisition are like to again different extent in different people's lives super super applicable there are practices that you can implement that can improve your ability to navigate the world efficient efficiently and the world will respond to you i believe very positively even though our our world at the moment doesn't really believe in those things and then the weirdest part of that is is that because of the whole you know butterfly effect if you're an individually aligned person your ability to have a cascading positive impact on the whole system is that much greater so like this is an emergent move and all emergent moves happen bottom up and so if you and me decide that we're going to sort out our shadow and sort out our shit and work out how to navigate the world more effectively we a don't know if we're randomly going to be like teaching the next nelson mandela or the next like cascading positive thing right we don't know because of the complexity of the system what positive impact they're going to have but we know that the more conscious and integrated we get the better things are going to go for us and the better things are going to go for everyone around us and we might randomly catalyze this move you know one of the things i wrote about in the paper is that they found that once three and a half percent of the population is engaged in the social movement it basically becomes inevitable right and that phase shifts do follow these kind of tipping point structures so like I guess, I guess to address the, the maybe Taoism isn't for everybody, maybe heroism isn't for everybody. Maybe the person that goes out and breaks the frame and delivers all these ideas becomes a prophet and gets crucified and all of these, the guy that delivers the message that you've all fucked up and you've all gone wrong, that's not for everyone because all we have to do is listen to that person. But I think each of us in our own individual lives can bring these wisdom practices and this relevance realization in. And what blows me away is people don't really tend to talk about it very much. Or at least I don't notice people talking about it very much. You Man, you threw me off with heroism because I, w- I had a different line of thought and then that brought, brought back something else. But I did want to be clear about one thing that you said uh, uh, that's clear in your writing too is like, be the change you want to see in the world because most people complain about the world and they want to change the world because it's much easier to try to go outwardly that way through selectivism than it is to change yourself. And you're trying to say, if you change yourself, if you deal with your shadow and ego, that is a uh, a light beam or a, some sort of a, a unifying force to the world. Is is it's more harder to deal with yourself, and so maybe you should focus on that first. It, it's actually much worse than that. It's much much worse than that. Um, which is that um, 
well, I go back to Aladdin, right? So in Aladdin, Aladdin gets three wishes, right? And all three of his wishes are catastrophes, right? He sets something in motion that he doesn't understand. And the one of the ubiquitous myths is the be careful what you wish for myth, that you go to the evil witch and you say, I want to be beautiful. And something horrifying happens as a result of that that leads to the end of the story, if it has a happy ending, you going back and being like, I'm really sorry, what I should have just done was try to be myself, right? Aladdin, that's how Aladdin ends, is that like he should have just been himself with Princess Jasmine all, all the time. And this actually speaks to, I think, an incredibly profound idea, one that I haven't unpacked yet, but I've been thinking about for like literally five or six years now, which is this idea of, of top down, where like you know, Mao and smash sparrows, right? And I think in the 1950s, Mao was like, all right, sparrows are eating all the grain, we're going to kill all the sparrows. So they kill all the sparrows and it uh, the locust population goes out of control and it kills 50 million people, right? It is the worst man-made uh, disaster of all time um, because he prodded something in a system that he didn't understand. And that actually is kind of the way the left hemisphere acts, right? It's like, oh, I'm just going to move this brick over here. You know what? I'm just going to put an engagement algorithm on my social network. I'm sure that'll be fine because it's going to make me a bunch more money. Oh, wait, catastrophe, right? Like you see this cascading effort all the time. So it's like, actually the individual is the only level you should be thinking about doing things, which is right. Okay. All right. The outside world is smarter than me. I'm going to respond to its cues, hopefully in a judicious way. And that's a big hope, right? That's an impossible balance, right? But you do respond to the world in a judicious way. And you start with yourself with your own consciousness. The problem with like 19 and 20 year olds, like protesting, and I you know, find that has merits, is that like a much more positive thing to do is have the aligned individual, the person that's come alive. That's perfect. Uh I was going to go a whole other tangent, to, to but I'll hold that back. Of, is like you're all basically saying is like atrophic cascades. We don't know the cascade of consequences from a reaction. That's what drives me crazy about consequentialist philosophers, right? They 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 think you could view all those cascades that you never know what actually can happen. But going back to the the heroism idea, I remember this was the other piece that you remind me. Of, that's why it threw me off for a second. Is like um, that I was reading in yours, and I'm curious what how how you would because this is what I'm really highlight is the nuance, right? Like you did a great job and you you try to reduce and redu like have a, a easily readable paper, right? But there's a lot of nuance under there that I want to kind of pull back out on. And one of them is the idea of heroism or the hero's journey. And correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say it's your your homie Rory Sutherland that's talked about like, no, there's actually not just five storylines. You know, there's actually a multitude of storylines. And if we keep reducing it to hero's journeys or Bill Doug's Romans or, or storylines, like then we're, we're reducing the the nuance of, of human existence. And so what I said, what I started with is my intellectual uh, dyslexia is when I hear about like the hero's journey and those heroic stories and those myths, like you're saying in the beginning, those myths, to me, those myths perpetuate the left hemisphere. And this is where I may be like intellectually dyslexic because you're, you're putting in the societal influences and, and the directions that society wants you to go in and through that complexity. And so, you know, correct me where I'm wrong there. Yeah. Um, I love Rory. Rory is the bestest, but I think that's wrong. Um, well, I don't know what he's, exactly what he's saying, but I'll say what I'm saying, which is that um, I believe that the power of stories directly corresponds to their social usefulness or like, for want of a better term, their evolutionary usefulness, right? So like, I take the piss out of my wife for watching Real Housewives, but you, like Robin Dunbar said that 60% of human combination is gossip because social, social cohesion and understanding social dynamics is existentially important, right? Breaking bad and better call Saul, right? They're massively popular because they show the cascading negative effect of bad moral decisions, right? Like there's all these things that convey information that's important. And I believe the strength of, and interest of that narrative on a very rough basis, right? Not one-to-one, -one, right? Roughly corresponds to how useful that story is. So the monomyth is popular now. And I don't know whether it was popular 3000 years ago. It wasn't as popular 30 years ago based on Hollywood blockbusters. But right now, this one story is so popular because it's about the evolution of consciousness. It's literally about returning the right hemisphere over the left. It's literally about moving away from abstraction. It's literally about in integrating your own consciousness and confronting your shadow. And I can go as long or as deep as people want on that. But my view is that because societal changes are emergent, they get reflected in what we're interested in. Our right hemisphere controls our exploratory att attention. It basically points us in the right direction. And so that people are getting so interested in the hero's journey. It's 11 of the 15 highest grossing movies ever, including Avatar, which is literally, like Avatar is literally could not be more accurate. And it's even about environmental destruction, right? Like 
it may not be everyone's favorite movie, but like it's literally about a guy achieving a higher a higher level of consciousness and realizing he shouldn't be destroying the environment, right? Like it's 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 as cliched as you can possibly get. So yeah, there are a million storylines. I'm not saying there aren't a million storylines, but people that look at Marvel and Pixar and Star Wars and they're like, guys, why do you keep remaking the same movie? Is it because you're like like you're like creatively bankrupt? I'm like, well, yeah, maybe, but like that's not a sufficient answer. Why does this one story sell every single time it gets produced? What's in this story that makes it sell every time it gets produced? And when you move away from that story, you create a pile of crap, like at least subjectively in my opinion, The Matrix versus The Matrix sequels, or like The Force Awakens versus um, uh, the, the Last Jedi, right? Like you have these very strict structures that you can mess with a little bit on the margin, but if you mess with them too much, they lose the arc of the story and the arc of the story is what's important. And to address the left hemisphere claim, actually myth, and this took me years to work out, years. Campbell has this line, which is the purpose of myth is to harmonize mind and body. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And what he's talking about is he's taking abstract ideas and he's putting them in a flow, right? A story is a flow and a bunch of facts aren't. And so when you hear a story about something and you realize it applies to the model you have of your own body or your own mind or your own existence, it can resurface you. And the example I think of is like if you're in church and you're listening to someone tell a story from the Bible and your blood runs cold because you're like, oh, fuck, I haven't been living that way. I haven't been living according to this story that clearly has this evolutionary utility and you sort your life out, right? And you suddenly get converted to, to living your life in a different way. Like that's an extreme example, but it's more we're all drawn to this hero's journey because it literally is a story about the change in consciousness. That is the STS model. The hero's journey is the STS. Yeah, it just, so it reminded me of in a way, like then you brought up religion is like uh, in a way, uh, Nietzsche's idea of like uh, slave mentality of religion. That's why I wonder sometimes the hero's journey too, is it makes us feel solipsistic, like, like we're a hero and self-aggrandizement. I mean, now we have no autonomy or, or direction over our lives. And so it's like, it's that's what I meant about it. It's like putting us in the same rubric of the left hemisphere is like, we think we're driving the car, but meanwhile, we're a child in the back seat with a plastic steering wheel thinking we're like the the F1 driver, you know, or something like that. That's what I, that's why I told you, I have like intellectual dyslexia. So I read things the opposite way that maybe they were intended, but that was kind of like the, the way my brain was kind of working is like, it, it tells us all these stories that help us sleep at night, uh, not realizing like the, the, the overarching, you know, um, kind of journey we're on in a, sp a sense that we're maybe out of tune or out of touch with. But I want to try to, um, you know, tie things back together, even though they don't need to be tied back together. Um, but it, you started to talk about like when or if this is going to happen. And, you know, like you're saying, like, how can you predict the future is and you and I have talked about a little bit of this privately is like. I come from a history of like religious traditions. Like my father is a Zen Buddhist. Um, I studied comparative religions in college. I spent time with Hopi Indians, you know, Mahayana Buddhists, uh, shamans to, you know, um, Sufis and and all, all the like. And even going back, like some of the people I, I originally were in, it was in contact with, they were part of like the whole Esalen asked landmark, like human potential movement, more university, all that stuff. And what I found my entire life in the history of all that stuff is like, is, um, they're always talking about this change in consciousness is going to happen. And it's right around the corner. Right. And it's been, <laughs> it's been right around the corner my entire life. And it reminds me of like when I lived in Brazil, they, you know, there's a, there's an old saying that Brazil is the country of the future. And then Brazilians say, and always will be. Um, so, <laughs> so like, here's yeah. I just wanted you to kind of touch on that. It's like, and so that's what I was saying about um, Anais Nin and, and maybe seeing these uh, synchronicities is like, do we see what we want to see? And we think it's right around the corner but it, it might never get there. And, and, and is, and I, quite frankly, how is that not a better way of going for the life or a worse way? I mean, there's no judgment on if that's a better or worse way, but it's like, it, it's, we want to see it, it's right around the corner because it gives us a, a more, a, a broader color palette or maybe some more vivacity to our life. I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Um, I think that the things I'd say against it would be um, life doesn't ever get less complex, right? Life doesn't ever get less conscious, right? We're on a one-way trajectory, right? Like, like I understand that things are cyclical, right? Um, particularly in markets, but all of the evidence shows that life is getting more conscious, right? And then, and then you get back to time frames, right? Like, the '60s are not even a blink of an eye ago in terms of like the 
time frames that we're dealing with, right? That doesn't really help you and me because I, I don't really care about like a thousand years from now, right? And understanding how and when, I don't know. But Tarnas writing in 91, and he was a big excellent guy, wrote about the idea of like, the focus on embodiment, shamanism, psychedelics, you know, the body, the body keeps the score going to number one last year, despite having been published in 2014. Now, Aaron Rodgers talking about getting two MVPs from his ayahuasca retreats. Like, like there's something in the air right now. And again, I might just be overfitting and it might end up meaning nothing, not least because we have free will, right? I'm a big free will guy. And I believe that we have the power to drive this car over the cliff if we really want to. And there's no guarantee that, the forces of light win. Um, I happen to think they will because in an iterated game, cooperation tends to win. And all of these frustrated states tend to result in some sort of collapse and the emergence of a higher order at the end of that. Whether humans are part of that, I don't know, right? All a very long-winded, crappy way of saying I don't know. Um, again, the thing that I do know, because I've been living it over the last couple of years, is that all of these concepts are hyper-applicable to our own lives. Um, and there is a there there. I used to really subscribe to the Yuval Noah Harari story that like everything was a fiction just to just to create cooperation. And one of the things that I now believe, and it is kind of an article of faith, is that there is some sort of intelligent force that we can interact with that represents our evolutionary growth more than just beyond survival of the fittest. And I do believe that there is this niche that we can all start to inhabit as individuals, which makes our life go better and better. So like those are two kind of like heretical positions, which I've come to come to believe through personal experience, but it basically makes me much more, it makes me optimistic about my life and the life of everyone around me, whether this phase shift happens soon, I don't know. But it, when people get really super fucking gloomy at me and I'm like, we're all doomed, I'm like, this middle frustrated state is actually like archetypal. Like, this is what's supposed to happen. And Tana said the same thing. So you get this, you get this forest fire burn down stage of total nihilism. And Nietzsche said the same thing in Slave Morality, where he says, you know, like, you need nihilism to empty the cup so that you get a better, you get a better philosophy on the other side of it that's more real. And I think that actually we're going to go back to more of an indigenous understanding of the world because those dudes were right. Just science is only starting to work it out right now. Um, and if you live that way, your life goes better is the sure hand. No, it's so perfect. And it ties us back in perfectly to like to plug your essays again. And I, your most recent one was about, you know, your shadow and, and maybe your blind spots and everything like that. And so it ties in, you know, what I'm going to call the the Morgan dialectic, you know, simplicity test and <laughs> synthesis related to uh, related to the Hegelian dialectic. But the the one thing in I, I in this is what we're kind of going at the whole time, too, is like, you know, I always think about we we oscillate between these extremes, you know, however you want to call those extremes. But then part of it, especially when we start to talk about these dialectics, what always bothered me about Hegelian dialectic is you go since it's there's a thesis, antithesis, the synthesis, right? And everybody goes, great, we're done. And similarly, I wonder with your with your dialectic, when I always go, no, that endpoint is just the start of the next one. So it's much more circular than it is linear. And part of that, what I always, and I'm curious how you, how you deal with this is like, the problem is when we start going down these roads and we start, and let's say we, we bifurcate, you know, let's say the material world from the spiritual world is... Once we start going down these roads, we think the spiritual world then becomes a hierarchy where we're we're gaining um, more rank among the hierarchy. And to me, at the end of the day, it's still just people selling trinkets in the marketplace of the world, and it's still materialism and hierarchy. So, like, how do you get away from that? Whether it's material or spiritual, to me, they kind of blend into the same thing. And when you go through these kind of dialectics, you end up back in the same place. Maybe you're not any better off. So, I'm curious how you push back against that. Yeah, I've got a real problem with hierarchical development models yep. because, you know, the old joke is there's no one who talks about hierarchical development models ever thinks they're at the bottom of one. Right. <laughs> like all the Ken Wilber stuff of like, oh, yeah, they like the, they're like the kind of the, the millenarian angle of like, yeah, like yeah. sooner or later, everyone's going to be as enlightened as we are. Yeah. And I think that's like super problematic and really bad. Um, but there is still this idea where like, I think the way you get around the douchiness is it's you occupying your niche. You know, Thelonious Monk said the genius is he who is most like himself. So what you do is you end up getting an incredibly clear view of your place in the world, right? And then you get incredibly good at navigating it. But that's done 
through a series of insights that whatever you, you know like the structure of the sds or the hegelian dialectic where you have like your model gets created and broken 15 times a second when we're interacting with the world and then it's fractal so it's like it can operate happen in your life where your model of the world the way you're living is completely wrong you'll have a satori and a spiritual awakening and you'll get get thrown into chaos and then you'll reform at a higher level that's the spirit that that's the hero's journey so this whole dialectic process goes back and forth it's just an upward spiral so there is a level to it you just get every time you have an insight your worldview just gets a little bit better and a little bit clearer and i think the idea of being integrated rather than higher i find less problematic because higher consciousness just sounds like another way of abstracting yourself from the world perfect Absolutely brilliantly said. I want to thank you for indulging all of my my simpleton questions and my my intellectual dyslexia. So once again, plug away. Where can people find your essays? Where can people interact with you on Twitter? Or or quite frankly, if you want any other email, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you want. Yeah, I gave up all the other social networks and then filled all the available time with Twitter, much to the, the loss <laughs> of my, my wife and my wife and children. Um, to, at Tom underscore KCP on Twitter. Please DM me. I've received an insane amount of value in my life from people like you just randomly reaching out to me or me reaching out to you as i think was the case and just turning into phenomenal conversations twitter only works if you do it in real life in my opinion really yeah. does but the conversion rate is like 90 percent great people and then uh the kcpgroup.com uh, the insight section i publish every two weeks and then occasionally long form essays and i also host calls with uh, the most interesting people that I can find. So if you have found someone you think is unusually interesting or has a very interesting perspective, either on markets, investing, or the crazy stuff that we've just talked about, let me know. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Always enjoy our conversations. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate it if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on iTunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community. To those of you who already shared or left a review, thank you very sincerely. It does mean a lot to us. If you'd like more information about Mutiny Fund, you can go to mutinyfund.com. For any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and Jason is jason at mutinyfund.com or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson ME and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com slash newsletter. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Mutiny Fund, their affiliates or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants of this podcast are instructed to not make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. Listeners are reminded that managed features, commodity trading, forex trading and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors and you should not rely on any of the information as a substitute for the exercise of your own skill and judgment in making a decision on the appropriateness of such investments. Visit mutinyfund.com disclaimer for more information.